and try to live up to those edicts. Um, so sometimes when conferences like this take place, there's always a danger of parallel play when people kind of present their separate uh, reports without much interaction between the two. So it, uh, I've decided to try to map on what I was going to say, which you can pick up in the latest issue of the International Social Review in any case with some of the arguments that have been put forward by, by Radek and, and, and Alan and try to map that onto the questions of what's happening to the U.S. working class. And, which is, you know, the, the title is kind of rather grandiose, you know, the remaking of the U.S. working class. It might, you know, more likely we're talking about a snapshot of the U.S. working class today, a working class in transition by, uh, um, by a number of forces, both, both social, political, and demographic. So I just want to start talking off a, a little bit about um, the context for this in, in terms of the world economy and how it's developed since the uh, collapse of the USSR. Uh, in, in 1991. You know, in the 1980s, the U.S. was confronted by a challenge from Japan, right? You know, people might remember the coming war with Japan, written by the, the, the guy who runs Stratfor today. It's quite a nutty book. He actually talked about a shooting war, which was an economic war. About the U.S. was uh, about to be uh, put into number two. This was the political basis for, you know, political justification for the, 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 uh, that phase, the employer's offensive, which had started a number of years earlier in terms of uh, of concessions right across uh, manufacturing and unions, hammer unions. Um, and the idea was that the U.S. base was, well, we need to figure out a way to uh, uh, make a more impregnable fortress against this new competition. That's, that was the era of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. We're going to make a big economic unit. Uh, similar developments in Europe with the expansion of, of the European Union. And the idea was put forward at the time that we'll have, uh, you know, uh, higher skilled, high, better paid jobs remaining in the U.S with low pay, low, low wage jobs migrating to Mexico and for countries. And that will enable the US uh, uh, capitalism to revive itself and compete with the, the Japanese threat. And that was pretty that, that was the, the framework for the free trade deals of that era, that perspective. What happened and, and Richard Freeman, the Harvard uh, economist who um, uh, writes a lot about, about, about labor, labor markets, uh, talked about well that was a basic plan. But the collapse of the, of the USSR and the opening up of the world economy created a new, a new context for that. You think about the things that were driving globalization at that time, uh, not just financialization, the standardization of production, the, the push for the international standards organization, and so forth. That enabled capital to uh, begin to accelerate a process of investment, foreign direct investment, as well as other forms of investment in other parts of, of the world, and the big opening up of China, its turn to the market in the 1990s, uh, 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 to some extent India as well, created uh, great new opportunities for this, uh, uh, for this kind of expansion. And so it, it, the, the idea of NAFTA is that one unit, EU and the other, began to go by the boards as a new, vast new specter of exploitable <coughs> labor opened up for U.S. corporations. And uh, Freeman talks about this in terms of what he calls a doubling of the global labor workforce uh, in, the, in the 1990s uh, with China, the Chinese working class, the Indian working class, and other previously more autarkic or state-dominated economies coming into a world labor market, uh, and rather quickly, uh, a, a big turn towards investment in those countries. Because the US decided that actually the best way to compete with Japan wasn't actually getting in fortress North America, but actually using China and other East Asian tiger economies as a, as, a, as a export platform to compete with Japan. And so the, excel, so the perspective of US capitalism began to shift in that period to be able to benefit that. Now, it's worth noting that in the 1990s, US underwent uh, a manufacturing uh, re revival um, uh, with, a, with a somewhat weaker dollar and basic uh, a surge in investment at that time, competing rather successfully in a number of ways with Japanese and, and uh, uh, European competitors in that period. Um, but, and so this was the heyday of the miracle economy and, and the great revival of the US and, 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 the, and the, the new neoliberal boom in, in, full, in, in its, uh, in its, in its uh, uh, fullest manifestation. So that was, that was a period in, in that, is in that period when the US began to take advantage of this new playing field, with the, the single superpowers, you know, super America and so forth. And it was in that era also that the U.S. decided that it could really um, consolidate its position through a new, more aggressive phase of imperialism, capturing Middle Eastern oil, moving deep, penetrating into Central Asia as a wedge against Russia and China, as well as getting into the, the energy reserves in that area, which brought us the two wars. 
and you know, I disagree with people who said that the U.S. you know stumbled into wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq because they were so weak and they needed to assert military power to compensate for a declining economic power. It's quite the opposite. They thought that they could do anything. They thought that they you know they were on top of the world uh, economically, politically, militarily. Why not go for it? Uh, in terms of the budget deficits and so on, tax and cuts. You know. You know Famous political economist Dick Cheney said, "Deficits don't matter. You know, we're the world's reserve currency. We can we can do what we want." Uh, so that was the, the period in which the U.S. Uh, thought that they could have it all. As we know, and this is a talk about you know imperialism and wars, but they overreached um, in uh, in their imperial ventures, um, you know, massively taking what had been a surplus, which was quite an achievement by the U.S. economy, but a surplus and turned that in, into a, a massive deficit in, in a few short years by by you know, cutting taxes and waging uh, a four trillion dollar war, if you if you believe some of the statistics coming out of Stiglitz and his co-author, uh, that that saddled the U.S. economy with a number of problems, as we know, and uh, it set in motion also a number of trends. This 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 moving out into at the same time this moving out into the world uh, uh, through FDI and China and so forth uh, led to a shift in which the U.S. Um, by by today ac actually has its major corporations are getting about half their profits from overseas. And you had a steady hemorrhaging of manufacturing jobs right through the 2002-2007 expansion, which had never happened in the U.S. before. I mean, and not just a slow one, a big one. A loss of six million jobs in the course of, from, I think from 2000, 2009, something like that. Uh, so uh, in, in the U.S. was, in a sense, faced with a specter of what the, US, the U.K. had dealt with, which was a hollowing out what had been a traditionally dominant manufacturing power in favor of a more financially dominated economy um, uh, uh, and, and uh, they, they, they would still rule the world by virtue of the U.S. being the home corporation, the home base for, for some of the world's most powerful corporations. Uh, the, the, the collapse, however, uh, of 2007, 2008, uh, you know, uh, forced a reorientation on that. But before we get into that, I think we need to look back at just what the economy was coming coming from. And I actually uh, disagree with Alan that we've been having this, a, a similar uh, or the same crisis since early 1970s. I think you can document a, a stagnant period from the early 70s into the early 80s and then def definite recovery of the boom, a, a relatively mild recession, not, not if you were a worker, but in terms of capitalist terms in 1990-91, and then a resumption of the expansion uh, into the 90s, another relatively shallow recession in 2001, and then uh, a boom again, but, on, but, but on, a, on a shifting basis. One that was based by the end, of course, much more on consumer, you know, debt, debt, debt fueled uh, uh, consumer spending as opposed to a more, the more vigorous manufacturing based revival of the 1990s. But nevertheless, on a world scale, you actually saw, you know, the, the world economy uh, doubled between 1969 and 1990, increased another 60 percent between. Uh, 1990 and 2009 for a threefold increase since 1969. And um, that's huge. I mean, basically what that is a result of is the process of new centers of capital accumulation in China, the new the new industrialized countries, and so forth. Now, I'm, I'm wading, into, you know, wading into a fight in public with a uh, you know, few political comments on the platform, which is bound to get me in trouble. But I'm just stating my point of view, and I have time to develop or defend it. But I don't think that the idea of, a, of, of the um, of a, of a, of a steady crisis of decline, since that really explains the situation we're, we're, we're in. We actually had an expansion of the system. Now, it was contradictory. It, it favored uh, newly industrializing countries uh, and it, it, it expensive some of the advanced countries and so on. All that is undoubtedly true. But from the standpoint of the system as a whole, it was there. I think we're dealing with a problem of the traditional national accounts method of gauging these things uh, with, with Marxist analysis. I mean, it's not an easy problem. You know, it's a hot potato I'm throwing back to Alan. Or, or, or Doug and, and Radica. I mean, how do we, how do we begin to uh, uh, deal with this? But I think what Freeman wrote a few years ago on um, the eve of the crisis was quite suggestive. He says, look, with this doubling of the workforce, you basically have the global uh, rate capital labor ratio. You know, he doesn't use Marxist terms to describe it. Basically, he says, you know, this is a radical drop in the organic composition of capital, which paved the way for a new new profitability uh, on a world scale. Now, how that breaks down to different countries and you know, so forth, how that breaks down in terms of national accounts and where that accumulates and the world financialization. That's a, that's a pretty big topic, which obviously I don't have time to get into here, but I think that that uh, uh, takes us, uh, gives us some kind of picture of where the world economy was before the crisis. Since the crisis, of course, we have uh, the previous assumptions of that boom and how the economy is going to operate come into question by the capitalist class. And I think John Emanuel, the mayor of my city, Chicago, uh, laid out the perspective 
of U.S. Capitol, and he said on a talk show host, a talk show one, one Sunday morning, so shortly after Obama took office, was, you never want a crisis go to waste. And they didn't. I mean, Capitol has had, you know, since the early 70s, uh, the, the idea of weakening and eradicating unions and, and shifting the balance of class forces, and, and, and basically they saw the opportunity to consolidate that and, and qualitatively increase that process uh, in, in a short period of time. And they did that um, uh, by using the auto bailout as a, as a benchmark, as a signal for capital, much as the firing of the 10,000 and 11,000 air traffic controllers in 1981 by Ronald Reagan was a signal to go for the unions. The, the concessionary deal that, that bailed out the auto industry was also a, a, a benchmark for capital. Now, already in 2007, the UAW, which had been the premier union and the, the, the leading force in rising living standards for, the, for uh, U.S. workers, uh, union and non-union, for the previous uh, 70 years or so, became a leader in the way down. They, they agreed to a permanent two-tier wage. That anybody working who was hands not directly on the production line was going to work basically for half the wages of existing workers. The contract is reopened in 2009. Remember, we couldn't reopen the Goldman Sachs contract, right? We could reopen the auto workers contract. And those were, um, and that enabled uh, capital to basically eliminate decades of work rules, which had been a, a protection against uh, a human pace of work and, job, and, and a measure of job security and so on, uh, cut compensation in a number of a number of other ways, offloaded um, uh, health uh, benefit, retired health benefit obligations to a union controlled pension fund, vastly underfunded. The union said, well, our investment genius will make up the difference in the future. Uh, that framework became the benchmark for uh, capitalists across the country, uh, union and non union. So the, 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 the immediate precursor to the big Wisconsin labor rebellion over public sector, five minutes left, five minutes to go. Okay, uh, it was a series of wage cuts that were pushed through um, that, uh, with, that involved two-tier wages, kind of permanent temp temporary employment in a number of uh, you know, marquee uh, industrial firms like Harley-Davidson, Kohler, Mercury Marine, and so forth. Uh, it, that was the, the, the background for the Wisconsin Labor Revolt, which is, of course, around the attempt to um, eliminate the right of public sector workers to have meaningful collective bargaining. And that's been the, the pattern ever since. It's a thoroughly bipartisan agenda. It's being pursued by Republicans and, and Democrats alike. Uh, and basically, it's a classic good cop, bad cop scene, right? So you have if Scott Walker, the Republican governor in Wisconsin, wants to eliminate unions and right to organize, and the governors of Michigan and Indiana want to institute right to work and to form employer legislation. Uh, but the good guy Democrats, like Governor Cuomo or Governor Brown and Governor Quinn, and in uh, New York, California, and Illinois, uh, they, they want you to have your union rights. They just want to you know, lower your wages, lower your pensions, and so forth. And so the unions have been faced with a, a choice of you know, obliteration by the Republicans or try to make a partnership with the Democrats and with whatever uh, uh, elements of, of, of a partnership that they can manage to uh, maintain with, with uh, capital themselves. And so you have a situation where the U.S. at the same time, the U.S. is now surveying the, the scene internationally and say, look, we, we're not only going to lock in permanent lower wages and benefits, we're going to lock in permanent social wages in terms of putting Medicare and Social Security on the shopping block. Coupled with that, the rising labor costs in China uh, means that the U.S. At a, at a, at a, at a, has achieved already something that was perceived as something that might happen in efforts 2020, uh, rough labor cost parity with China today. And that's the plan. A permanent low-wage economy, permanent and deep cut in standard of living, low-wage, cheap energy based on fracking, <coughs> cheap social wage, which will enable the U.S. to run down its, its debt and deficit, to, so that the U.S. emerges as the most uh, effective fighter for, uh, you know, the effective pole of attraction for, for capital among the advanced countries. And in terms of the dollar, right, saying, well, yes, they're, you know, it's a world's reserve currency, they can't let it devalue all the way. I think they wouldn't let it devalue enough. They want to let it devalue it to a certain point. So they can have their cake and eat it too. Let's make the dollars, make sure that it remains the world's reserve currency. I mean, who wants the euro or the yuan at this point, which is being uh, devalued effectively by the, by the big um, quantitative easing. The dollar is okay for now, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have, like what they have, we're having increase in internal devaluation. We'll lower labor costs but while maintaining a relatively stronger currency by just cutting wages and benefits and so forth. And I think it's important to realize this is not Obama being pushed around by big corporations. This is the Obama uh, administration pushing through this. It's all, it has everything to do with what's happening in education reform today, about trying to vocationalize higher education, channel workers towards skilled jobs and so on, uh, uh, and, and sort of make tiers and rations within public education to be able to follow the workforce uh, where needed, you know, the dead end 
white uh, dead end uh, uh, retail sales jobs, which are more skilled, medium level skilled jobs, healthcare and so forth, uh, and, and, and a layer of, of high tech uh, uh, workers as well. Now I'm not saying it's going to work, but it's going to work immediately. In the manufacturing revival, uh, uh, after losing you know, six million jobs, they've got about half a million or a bit more than that since the recovery started. But this is a generational perspective. This is not about a one year or two perspective. It's not Obama's. This is the U.S. capital's perspective that we can't actually go down the road of the U.K., deindustrialize, and just become this rented economy. We actually have to have a serious manufacturing base and, and they're, and they're, they're going to maintain ourselves in imperial power. And therefore, as a result, we have to lock in these lower labor costs, which means, of course, trying to finish off unions is a meaningful force. Either eliminate them or, or, or break them as an effective force. Again, it's bipartisan, and Chicago is a good example of that. And I, I'll talk a little bit about the Chicago teacher strike, uh, which was, uh, I think, far and away the, the biggest labor success in some years. Now, it's a good contract that had a number of concessions. But was able to hold on, hold the line on a number of key fronts that the, that the parent union, the American Federation of Teachers, had given up a long time ago in terms of merit pay for teachers and other forms of job security, um, uh, 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 harsh evaluation uh, um, plans, which, which uh, in, in the case of Baltimore, has put only eight percent of the teachers on fast track for termination, virtually eliminate, make, basically made them at will employees. Uh, the CTU held the line on that. But it's not so much the fact that what they have line on, but it's how they did it. Because I think it was a, a model for what's going to have to be not just a, a union struggle, but, a, but a, a wider working class movement. They position themselves as defenders of public education. They put the issues of race and class, of apartheid education in Chicago, front and center. Uh, and they, they systematically work with all kinds of community organizations, which are not, not that big in their own right. And in so doing, managed to elicit a layer of support among people, find support among parents who were inconvenienced. I was one of them. I think I was in the picket line um, to to uh, to try to, to to win the strike. And Rahm Emanuel, obviously one of the most powerful legal politicians in the U.S., was stymied in his ability to try and break it. It was a very popular strike, probably the most popular big city teacher strike we've ever seen. And I think, to me, it reminded me of the uh, the, uh, the labor rebellion in, in, in Wisconsin and also Occupy, whose most revolutionary. Um, Implication, if you want, was was the fact that people no longer felt isolated. It was my bad luck and my poor choices that it put me in this position of not being able to provide for my family or employment. But actually, there's there's a collective problem here. There's a collective agenda here driving us. Now, the popularization of that, the one percent versus the ninety nine percent, now uh, is, is you know still needs to be elaborated, developed, and infused with with, with you know some theoretical and uh, political perspectives. That's really I think what this conference uh, uh, can do. Uh, and we're still at the early stages of that. I don't want to exaggerate. I'm not saying Chicago, I mean, there was a, a wave of local teacher strikes uh, in Chicago. I mean, I mean very local, in the surrounding small towns. Uh, it hasn't yet caught on across the U.S., where labor unions remain you know, paralyzed by the threat of annihilation on the one hand or, and, uh, and trying to cling to partnership with, with a with, and slow decline and hoping for something to get better. But the nature of the capitalist perspective is this is not, a, this is not we're in a depression. It's, going to con it's continued for you know, seven years six years, seven years, if you want to count it. And as a result, they, they're going to use what's basically a, a, a pretty well-established reserve army of the unemployed, you know, which has enabled them to keep low pressure on wages so that even in the, in the, since the recovery began uh, in 2010, there's been little or no, in some cases, regression in terms of, in terms of wages. Um, labor now comes as a supplicant rather than, uh, rather than power worker. You know, when I was growing up, there was something called big labor, capital B, capital L. And, and today, it's, 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 it has a negligible impact on politics. And so what the CTU strike does, and what Occupy did, and Wisconsin Labor Rebellion did, I think, is point to uh, an elemental, but nevertheless real and palpable um, sense of rebellion that's out there, a sense of radicalization that has to be given some kind of shape and direction. The Chicago Teachers Union brought, brought that to the point of production. That was key. Now there's a big, another fight in Chicago in which they're closing 54 schools, much more difficult terrain to fight on. Which which is, is put pressure on on on, on, uh, on a city where some of those poorest and vulnerable people are, had to fight for some basic resources. And the union has not has not missed a missed a beat even after the the list was put forward and, and, and there's been all kinds of different struggles which you know can go into. But I think that really is the model for what the labor movement has to become. It has to become a, a working a wider working class movement. I think the Fight for 15 movement in Chicago, Fight for $15 an hour for downtown retail stores, also gives a sense of that. On Wednesday, it was not a huge, but several hundred workers walk out of their jobs and kind of walk out <coughs> called strikes, with big grandiose term for it, but, but very significant in terms of the people who, 
who make the city go in terms of uh, um, its, its retail and, and food establishments coming out and making themselves known and actually getting a lot of po uh, uh, positive support for that. Now, are the unions serious about that? Are they going to create um, uh, organizing centers where people can fight for wage and hour claims and unfair labor practices and so on, short of actually organizing a union? That remains to be seen. But if they put a lot of money on, out on the table and they, they hire in some of the best organizers in town to do that, that uh, provides us with some kind of uh, um, opportunity to make that, to, to, to shape that struggle. And so what does all this have to do with the big questions of political economy coming up? I don't think that, um, you know, for, for almost its entire existence, the U.S. labor movement has been very narrow, it's bread and butter issues, partnership from craft unionism of, of a century ago to today. And um, it, when, it's, when it's had its greatest steps forward is when it's had been infused with radicalism, uh, with socialist, communist, revolutionaries playing a wider role, putting in that broader class perspective. I think that's never been more essential. I think that because if labor doesn't have this, this wider fight uh, and this wider perspective, doesn't actually try to bring some understanding of political economy in, in, in a popular basic way into the class struggle, uh, it's, not, it, it's really not going to be able to uh, gain, regain its footing and move forward. But you know, based on uh, what I've been, what I've seen just, just the other day, Wednesday, about the, uh, uh, you know, low-wage workers who, you know, 25-year-olds who can't move out of their parents' home, and and uh, someone who, you know, who, who's uh, uh, laid off for being five minutes late, you know, with a small child and, and twins, and getting to talking about the profits of their corporations and, and how much they're making with with great with, with great clarity and accuracy, tells you that that's possible. It's happening, and I think that's really the role of. Of, of Marxist, socialist, and activists to try to make those connections with, uh, with, the, with the broader theoretical apparatus we had, we can, you know, with bring with with it our various debates as well.